Welcome everyone. It's 12 o'clock or 12:30, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Sarah Sims and I'm the manager of continuing education for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you for joining us for today's Open Classroom program. Open Classroom, if you're not familiar, is the Brown School's virtual and free prof professional development series. Beyond Open Classroom, we are um, the largest provider of continuing education units in the state of Missouri. So if you are looking for CEUs or if you just wanna deepen your learning a little bit further, I invite you to check out our website, which is brownschool.wustl.edu um, and navigate to the resources and initiatives tab. I'll put a link in the chat as well. Um, we offer workshops year round on nearly a weekly basis on super diverse topics. So as we get started today, a few housekeeping items. We can't see or hear you, but you are able to engage in the chat. And our presenter today is going to ask for some interaction. Um, so please do put your thoughts, your, your comments in the chat, as well as any questions, because we'll also have time for Q&A at the end. Um, this will be live streamed on YouTube. I'll drop a link to that in the chat as well in a moment. Um, but we cannot moderate the Q&A on YouTube. So now I'm going to introduce and welcome my colleague, Dr. Rupang An. He's an associate professor here at the Brown School, and he's also the leader of our intel artificial intelligence series. Um, and he also offers a, a really great professional certificate course on AI, which we are offering again due to very popular demand this fall with more info coming. So um, I'll put another link to the chat in that as well. So without... Uh, Further ado, Dr. Ahn, please uh, feel free to introduce the program for today and our speaker. Sure. Thank you so much, Sarah. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our open classroom series on artificial intelligence in social sciences. We are thrilled to have such a diverse audience joining us today to explore the incredible possibilities of AI, machine learning, and deep learning in social sciences. And our series aim to provide a comprehensive overview of AI's applications in big data analytics. We're also exploring the use and misuse in social science research and practices. So we've gathered an impressive lineup of distinguished speakers from both academia, industry, and social natural sciences, each with the unique experiences and insights to share. We are confident that these presentations will inspire you as they take you on a journey through their own personal experiences with AI. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Matt Schneider, a highly accomplished statistician and data privacy expert who has made significant contributions to the field of marketing, forecasting, and data privacy strategy. I have had the privilege of knowing Matt for many years, uh, as we both pursued a doctoral degree uh, in Santa Monica and the graduate school. So as a scientific lead for some of the largest FinTech, pharma, insurance, and retail companies, Matt has developed flexible statistical methodologies that enable organizations to generate valuable data while safeguarding consumer privacy. He has also played a crucial role in validating data science and forecasting models for pre-IPO fintech companies. In addition, he has worked with numerous uh, Fortune 500 companies to improve their analytics uh, and frameworks. So mass research has been published in prestigious academic journals, such as the Harvard Business Review, the Journal of Royal Statistics Society, Marketing, Science, and so many others. Prior to his current role as an associate professor of statistics at Drexel University, Matt was an associate professor of marketing at Northwestern University and a visiting scholar uh, at Cornell University. He has also served as the director of research at Fort Rock Asset Management, a hedge fund based in Portland, Oregon. In addition to his impressive academic credentials, Matt has a distinguished military background having served in the U.S. Navy as an officer of the deck and surface warfare on the USS Boxer. He holds a PhD and master's degree in statistics from Cornell University, a uh, master's in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon University, and a bachelor's degree uh, in quantitative economics from the United States Naval Academy. 
So without any further ado, uh, let us welcome Professor Schneider to present his talk. All right, um, thank you so much for having me, everybody at the Brown School, I appreciate it. Uh, An, thanks, thanks. Uh, I guess Professor An, as you call him, and Sarah, uh, thanks for having me as well. So today, let me share my screen. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about data privacy. So give me a second. There we go, you should be able to see this. Let me know if you can't see it. Um, it'll be a little bit interactive. So type in the chat if you have any responses to my questions. I'm going to highlight one of my papers that have, has been published in Marketing Science, but also give you an applied look as to how you can use this stuff for applications that you might encounter while you're working. Okay, so here's where I work. Uh, I'm at Drexel University in Philadelphia. My office is uh, should be right there where the arrow is. So just let me know if you're if you're coming first. It's right at the uh, train station, about one hour to Manhattan by train. And first, I'll talk about just overall data privacy, uh, just the, the major landscape, and then we're going to play a little game to see if you can identify where the privacy risks are in sample data sets. All of these were usually research that I've done before. I will follow up with going into my paper that's published in Marketing Science, and here's my co-authors that I've worked with for a number of years. And finally, I'm going to talk about some solutions to different data privacy problems that we originally talked about and then open it up to questions. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> so um, if you look, if you go to Verizon and look at a DBIR, data breach investigations report. There were over 5,200 data breaches in 2022, which is uh, this past year. Can anybody guess how many there were in, let's say before privacy legislation really had an impact in the US, uh, let's say uh, 2019, does anybody know? Uh, you can type in chat if you have a guess. I can see your chat. How many data breaches do you think there were in the year 2019? Okay, so somebody guessed 100 million. It's a good guess, maybe. Well, I should say detected data breaches, right? Because there's a difference between detecting them and them happening. Anybody else with a guess? All right. <clears throat> well, um, this was after privacy legislation, in particular CCPA in California, which a lot of businesses now have to go through extra steps to protect their data. Turns out in 2019, there were about 2,000 data breaches, right? So that's less than half there are today. So please note that even though there's been a lot of privacy legislation and a ton of money poured into this space, right? There's, there's entire uh, you know, businesses that have been created out of this space. Uh, also, a lot of uh, legislative uh, changes, uh, you know, big legal business. The data breaches have more than doubled despite legislation, right? So, yes, companies might be paying fines, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your privacy has increased. In fact, it could have decreased. You know, this could be due to a number of factors. For example, there's just more data being collected. But I'm going to talk to you about what we can do assuming that data breaches are going to go up and up no matter what, right? Because technology outpaces law. All right, so my argument and essentially my entire research focus over at least 10 years has been to anonymize data. And I use the word anonymization very lightly because it still might be possible to uncover uh, some hints at, at who people are. So one, we should assume that the data will get out eventually, right? So any data that you're sharing with a company, any data that you write on chat GPT, you should assume that it gets out eventually, right? So if we do it this way, um, then when the data breach does happen, oh, by the way, one third of those data breaches were due to internal actors like employees, right? When it does happen, you'll be more protected. 
All right. Two, an added benefit of anonymizing data is that consumer privacy and trust is increased. So what I mean by that is when you would buy a product, let's say 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and it might have, um, let's say, a good housekeeping seal on it or, or some certification, right? You're establishing a relationship of trust between yourself, right, and the company that's selling you that product because you expect it to last a little bit longer, right? So if companies actually go and anonymize data, I'm not talking about just, you know, abiding by what the law says. I'm talking about actually anonymizing physically the actual data that you give them, right? The trust between the consumer should be increased. So that's another advantage of anonymizing data. And then three, and this is most interesting, I, I think you'll see it by the end of the talk, good anonymization can ensure purpose limitation. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're doing, uh, this is a, you know, you have a public health degree here. Let's say you're doing a public health survey, right? And you're specifically collecting it to increase uh, medical care for a certain population uh, for a specific disease in your city. Right. You launch the survey for that purpose. You collect data to analyze that purpose. Right. If that data is anonymized well, you should still be able to do that purpose well and get those people the care that they need. However, two years later, when somebody else gets that data set, they shouldn't be able to use it to send ads to those people, let's say from insurance companies. Right. So I'm going to talk to you about how to do that during during this. So let's open it up to uh, some interaction. So what I have here is I'm gonna have a bunch of slides. The first one's on retail data. And I'm asking you, the audience, where the privacy risk is, all right? So what we see here is transaction data. So let's let's say it's, um, you know, this could be, uh, for example, a, a Target that you're going shopping at, right? This is the customer database. So we see on the right-hand side, there's three people, Susan Smith, John Smith, Ryan McCauley, right? We have demographics. This is very typical to the data you would receive at these companies. We have a timestamp of when they were in the store. And then we have how much they spent, right? And how many items they purchased. Does anybody see any privacy risks here if this data was shared or breached? Because remember, we're assuming that it's going to get out eventually. And I'm looking at chat, so I'll wait. So the way this is work, I'll, I'll wait about 15 seconds or 20 seconds. If I don't see anything, then I'll then I'll uh, say some risk. All right. So obviously, the people's names are here, the customers' names, right? So if this gets out, we know. Yep, the real name, right? You, you said the real name. That's right. So the real name. So, so, so we have what's called personally identifiable information, which is their real name. Uh, and then Sarah said, if the person's, if we have their gender and zip code, they become, become more easily located. Absolutely. We don't even need their real name, right? Because if we have gender, zip code, and let's say age, they might be unique in that zip code. There might be only one, one 79 year old male in that zip code. Maybe, probably not, but, but maybe, or maybe there's 10 of them, right? But since we have their name anyway, you know, uh, they're already identifiable, right? And then we have a timestamp of physically where they were at at a specific time, right? Because this is at a retailer A, right? We might be able to infer how much income they have based upon what they spent, right? So, uh, and then An said, um, I should say Professor, Professor An said, uh, if he or she lives in a less popular zip code, then it's more likely to be identified. That's correct. So, so if the zip code has less people in it, right, and you have their gender and their age, there's probably less of those in that zip code. So it's more identifiable. All right. So now I'm going to show you another piece of data, which is kind of of a store next to retail array, directly next to it. And I just want you to look at the bottom here. And you can read more about this at the last slide. I'll have a link where you can go to Harvard Business Review and uh, you can read this entire article. What you see here is retailer B did what's called pseudo, pseudo anonymize their data, which is they removed the direct identifiers of the personally identifiable information, like the real name. 
And now they just have the age, gender, and zip code, right? Which still has that risk that you stated, but it doesn't have their name. So this data might be considered non-personal, right? So it might be considered protected, let's say by GDPR. However, does anybody see the risk here? Let's say you got retailers B, B's data that they shared it with you, right? Does anybody see the risk? You might be working at retailer A, right? It's the linking risk here. That's, that's the risk, good. Somebody just wrote in the chat. So what happens here is at retailer B, even though you didn't know John Smith bought birth control products, right? You can know it because the age, the gender, and the zip code are pretty unique in combination, and they're linking to retailer A, right? And also, you can see that these stores are pretty close to one another, and the time difference is, is quite small, right? So now we can start sending John Smith different ads uh, related to birth control or no different things uh, about him, right? So you can see that some of these privacy risks are quite complicated. And because of this linking risk, uh, what happens is both retailer A and retailer B are at fault. All right, so we wanna think about how do we change this as I go through this presentation. Okay, here's another one. Here's a, a text that you might post. Like, let's say um, you either leave an online review, you type it into chat GPT, you leave it under teaching evaluation, right? Um, I've had my scarf for 10 days and I love it. It is warm and stylish for a 25 year old woman in Chicago. Does anybody see the privacy risk here? This is textual data. There's many. So somebody wrote that the tweet has geographical information. Yeah, so you, we can see here that it says Chicago. So we got the location of this person off of it. Anything else? Yep, we have uh, age, yep, 25 year old. We have weather, that's interesting, right? So we might know uh, if there's not a timestamp on this, like uh, maybe what time of the year it was. Anything else? 10 days ago is another timestamp. We know when they were in the store, provided they didn't lie. That's right, in conjunction. And then, you know, the, so, so here's exactly what, what everybody said, was we have four, yeah, we have gender too. We have sh four structured variables or structured, right? We have the transaction date because it's 10 days ago. We have age, 25 years old. We have a uh, woman and we have uh, Chicago. Right, so we have four items here. And does anybody see the fifth? There's a fifth item, and I'm not counting warm. There's something else going on. Yeah, there's a product, there's scarf, right? So we can, we can certainly narrow it down by product, right? So maybe there's only one customer, likely there's only one customer in this group. But there's some, the other thing going on is the writing style. Right, how this person uh, writes the review might be a further clue to who wrote it, right? And it doesn't just have to be a review, it can be a number of different things. And I'm gonna show you, I have published research on this and you can find it all at the end. But here's another example of how writing style might come to important. If you look at this is, um, I believe this is on Yelp and I know Yelp's uh, relatively outdated now, but you can see uh, Alan here and I'll skip through this one. Uh, if you're looking at the writing style, you can see that there's a couple of unique features. One is Alan uses a lot of colons and uses these uh, enumerated lists, the first, the second, the third, and final. I believe Alan's grammar is written pretty well. He uses a lot of uh, contractions, I've, um, right? So all these different things can help identify people. And what we found with our research is that if we have a hundred anonymous people based upon their writing styles, right, and we get enough training documents on them, we can, we have about a 50% chance of guessing who is who correctly. 
right? When, when random guessing would be about 1%, right? So if we have enough writing samples, it's easiest to do it on student essays. And then uh, the next easiest is email. The next one after that is online reviews and then tweets are the hardest likely because they're shorter, all right? And oh, by the way, if you're wondering about posting a review online, if I use, this is out of 1.32 million reviews. If I use your first name and your last initial, right? Um, over half, over half of those categories. So if my first name is Matthew, last initial S is in Sam, right? Over half of those unique categories are completely unique. In other words, you're the only person with that first name and last initial out of 1.32 million, right? So you can often figure out who people are just by a couple of these structured variables. So Professor Ahn wrote, we should ask ChatGPT to rephrase my review on Yelp using Shakespeare's writing style. Absolutely. So if ChatGPT wasn't out, I would say translate it to Chinese, then to Vietnamese, then to uh, uh, Romanian and back to English, right? Or you could ask ChatGPT, but be careful because there's a caveat with ChatGPT. Anything you feed into it, that's data that it accepts, right? And now your data is in there anyway. We don't know how all these patterns in the neural networks, right, are being saved. So I'd be careful of putting it into ChatGPT directly. I might put it into a translator that doesn't save your data, translate it in three different languages back to English, then put it into ChatGPT to write it into Shakespeare's writing style. Okay. So I'm gonna go into uh, the paper and I'm not gonna to try to spend too much time on the paper. I just wanna give you an example after this next one. Uh, so this is survey data for policy make making. This is an actual, let's see if you can see the privacy risk here. This is an actual example, right? Of a public health survey that was done in Austin, Texas for Asian Americans to improve their quality of life. You can get this download of this data right now online. The, the privacy risk should be obvious here, but I'll let somebody say it if they want to say it. There's so many privacy risks here. And by the way, there's thousands of people. So we can see here that the age is a continuous number. Gender, right? I believe they have two categories. Ethnic origin, unfortunately, they have like over 70 categories. So the more categories you have of any of these variables, the more... E you know, likely it is to identify them. You have Burmese in here, right? How many Burmese female 23 year olds are actually in Austin, right? Maybe not that many. Plus you have a zip code, religion, born in the USA, years in the USA. So now you're narrowing down when they, when they came here, right? Years in Austin. And then they have a hundred different questions that they asked, right? So my point with this survey, right? This was intended to improve the quality of life of Asian Americans in Austin. But later, all of that data was released online, right? Because the public paid for it. So it's on one of those open data sites. And now you can do whatever you want with it, right? So I'm not sure that these people that signed up for this actually intended for all their information and also has income levels on here, how religious they are on a scale, you know, intended uh, for all their information to be online. One of my papers uses this data set and provides a solution for essentially what they should have done. And I believe, I'm not sure the research may have been in public health. I'd have to double check on that. But certainly, uh, you know, they weren't thinking about, about these issues, right? And the last one, I'm just throw this out for food for thought is uh, GPS data, right? Uh, most of Americans cell phone GPS coordinates are actually uh, sold and shared. Uh, you can buy them from different companies now and see all your trajectories, right? So how would you protect, protect that? And that one's really challenging. All right. <clears throat> so we talked about why to anonymize data and then how to anonymize data. So one is aggregation, right? So, in, so instead of, for example, saying somebody's 23 years old, we might say they're 20 to 29. Instead of saying these items cost $53 and we might uh, average it with four other items and say the average price is $75, right? We might use top coding. If somebody makes over 100,000, we say they make 100,000 or more. 
But the key feature in a lot of my research is that we need to consider how the data is used with different applications. All right, because if we know that, then when we protect it, we can make sure that those patterns of how the data is used are inside of the protected data. And that's the goal. So when we go to my marketing paper, and you can find this in marketing science, or if you Google this online, happy to send a copy as well. It takes place in the setting of a retail store like CVS, right? And you can see in this picture, although it's a little bit choppy, there's some items on sale, that's called a promotion. There's some items that are being featured, right? Or on display. So at the end of the aisle, it's called feature or display if, if they're displayed prominently. Each one of these items also has a price. And then uh, the store you know, records how many are sold each week. So when you look at the data, it looks like something on the bottom, this table here. So we have the, these are weekly sales. Okay, so if you buy this data, from a company like IRI or Nielsen, they'll give you weekly sales of a brand. So this is laundry detergent like Tide. They give you a price, $3.99. So 100 Tide laundry detergents were sold at $3.99, right? From store number one, all right? And this was in, let's say last week. It was not on promotion, so zero. So it was not on sale and it was not featured or on display. Right now we go to a, a different store, uh, which is store number two. It's called anonymous, right? This is like a store ID, like you would do uh, using any kind of medical or public health data. You would have an anonymous ID. The price is higher at five ninety nine, so less were sold. Nine were sold, right? When the price goes up, sales go down. That's that's pretty obvious. So this is what the data typically looks like. This is the data that we've used. So there's five different brands of products. There's 34 stores and there's 102 weeks of data, all right? Now, when they share or sell this data, the store identity is masked, like you see here. So they're not gonna say it's the store on Market Street, it's the store on Main Street. They're not going to say that. There's a privacy issue here. When this data is gathered and sold or shared, the company that is collecting the data, because these stores are reporting this data, right? The company that's collecting it, they don't want you to know which store sold 100 items at this price in that particular week. Because if the store can be identified, it breaks the trust between the store and the company selling the data, one. And then two, a competitor can open up a store across the street, know exactly what the margins are of the store and price it a little bit lower to put them out of business, right? So that's why privacy is important for a data set like this. And what they currently do is called aggregation. So what they currently do is they'll take all these prices over a certain geographical area and average the $3.99 and $5.99. And they'll get something closer to $4 because they weight the average by the number of sales, right? And they're only sell that data, all right? And they'll replace these prices uh, with essentially that average price. Now, what you lose there is uh, now you can't really explain why there are more sales here versus here because now they both have the same price. That's called aggregation, all right? There are some other methods like adding a random number. I'm not gonna go too much into that. There's no protection, which is selling, you know, basically selling or sharing the data as you see it. Of course, if there's a data breach, then all the data is out there, right? And I, I assume this is what tip, typically is done with encryption, all right? And then there's what my paper is doing, which in my paper, what we do is we take the sales and we generate a fake number based upon all the patterns between price, brand, sales, whether it was on promotion or whether it wasn't. And we try to limit the ability of an intruder to identify which store it actually was. So before I said it's important to, to know how the data is used, all right? And so anytime you do any kind of privacy protection or you're talking about privacy issues, you, you should ask the end user, the data user, how do you use the data and why do you need it? Why are they buying it, right? They're buying it because they need to know how to price their items in the store, all right? They need to know whether to put it on sale. So that's a valid use, that's a valid business use, right? And these data users on the bottom are receiving protected data. They still need to be able to do that. But what they shouldn't be able to do 
is the invalid use, which is, hey, which store is this? Which store gave me the data? Because they should only be worried about how do they price the items in their store, right? Or how do they price their items? In turn, for receiving that protected data, the data users give money, right, to the data provider, the one that collects all, all the data. So, for example, AC Nielsen in this case, right? And then in turn, AC Nielsen has to give this privacy guarantee to the stores that supplied the data, which are these retail stores, right? So that they can keep the flow of real data going back to AC Nielsen. So this is a whole trust cycle. And this exists even if you're in public health doing surveys, right? So the data user could be the analyst of the survey, right? The retail store will be the actual uh, person that you're recording the data on. And maybe the data provider is you, right? You might be running the survey. <clears throat> okay, so let's just get into it. Uh, okay, now there's only gonna be a couple pages of formulas. So if you don't understand it, don't worry, I'll try to explain it uh, as light as possible. So first, how do the data users use the data? Well, if I go back a couple of slides, we see this valid use. They need to know how to price their items and also whether to put their items on sale. This is the model they use. Yeah, it looks mathematical, right? This is called the ScanPro model. This is called the ScanPro model. It's used by thousands of stores to price items, right? What it does and you can take the logarithm of both sides and then you have what looks like a regression model, right? So the left side S is sales right? And then you have prices, display, uh, whether something's on promotion, right? And you're seeing if I put something on promotion, how much do the sales increase? It's basically just like a regression model with your Y variable as sales. This quantifies the effect of prices promotion uh, on, on brand sales, right? And you get a specific estimation that spits out here. So the whole idea here is as long as we can maintain this pattern that's going on here, right, as long as we can maintain that pattern, then our customers here, which are our data users, uh, will be happy because they can still, you know, perform their valid use. And there was a question in the chat, is there a monetary incentive for retail stores to provide data to a provider or the retail stores get some data? Yes, the retail uh, stores, uh, you know, will uh, get an incentive for providing uh, their data Right, and also uh, these are like two-way contractual relationships. So the last time I checked, um, there there were monetary incentives, but I'm not sure exactly what they're what they're doing right now. Okay. All right, so here's the patterns that the data users need to know. All right, so this is important. So you need to ask, for example, if the goal is to make sure that a certain subpopulation gets uh, a standard of care uh, for specific disease detection, right? Let's say they're pre-diabetes. You need to make sure that that pattern, uh, that you're aware of that pattern. Right. All right. <clears throat> Next, uh, without that, typically these companies, I spell AC Nielsen wrong, will aggregate market level data. So they'll just add up right, average the prices, so you'd get $4.28, right? This is pretty effective uh, against re-identifying a store if an intruder came in, but it shows that, uh, like we calculated it, and your pricing elasticity, which is how much your sales change when, when you change the price, it's off by about 50% on average, right? So, so your pricing is going to be uh, really off when you use these averages instead of the real data, up to 50% off, right? So, so that's why we needed a better solution here, right? So you can have privacy and also you're increasing the usefulness from the standard protection approaches, which are overprotective. We also model a data intruder. So here, I'll, I'll just skim over this. This will give the data intruder a probability, right, that a specific data row that you saw before, like 100 uh, of tied laundry detergents at a certain price, right, belong to a specific store. So they're trying to do matching, right? 
So this gives a probability of uncovering the true identity of a store. So you need this to see how effective your data protection is. <clears throat> All right, so that's what's called the privacy assessment. So we wanna see how effective the privacy uh, protection is. If we just use the real data, we find out that sales has the highest predictive power. So those sales when they were 100 or nine, those were actually most predictive of which store it was, right? Not the price, because a lot of the prices were standardized across stores already, but the sales were most predictive. So that's the most important thing to protect first. We wanna release useful yet privacy protected data. And how we're going to do that is generate what's called synthetic sales. So fake sales from the data providers model. And uh, how much time do we have left? I just wanna make sure that we're on time. Excluding questions. Um, if you can wrap up in about 10 minutes, that should okay. be good. Sure. Okay, so here's the key. So when we create fake data, this is the model that's creating fake data, right? If you notice, it looks very similar to how the data is used. You just take the logarithm of each side and we're generating synthetic sales from this model, right? So it's popping out a random number that has all these patterns in it, right? So that's what the protected data, that's how it's being generated. It's done in a more mathematically complicated way with a Bayesian random effects model to where I have a privacy parameter that's called kappa all right, and I can change that depending upon how influential I want each store's information to be, right? And if you look at these graphs, and I'll show you in the interest of time, as I'm increasing kappa, what's going on is these brand effects, all right, this is the brand effects on, uh, from pricing, are becoming uh, essentially all the same. So as kappa goes up, my privacy protection is going up. Right, and those synthetic, those fake sales that I'm generating from this model are all similar, right? They're all coming from the same probability distribution, the same patterns, regardless of what brand it is. And for the same thing, the store effect, all right? As I increase kappa, the same thing's going on. So a low kappa, less privacy protection, the patterns are more real, but they're still fake. A high kappa, more privacy protection, and the, the patterns, more look the same, regardless of what store or what brand you come from. All right, if I look at this chart in red here, what I have are the true data. So we can see here that store 12 has about a 25% probability of being identified. Store 31 has about a 12%. And you might say, well, that's pretty low. Yeah, it's somewhat low, right? This is not true for all applications. But you should know in some of my work with pharma, if this probability is above 9%, it's considered a privacy breach. So if you can identify somebody in a clinical study report with probability of at least 9%, now it's a privacy breach, right? So sometimes you have to limit this. The proposed model in green gives essentially every store about a 5% or less uh, probability of being identified. But then we look at the information loss. So if you remember your ability to price your product, right? That pricing elasticity, how far is it off? Well, if you just average across the market level what they're currently doing, they're about at 45%, right? If you use the true data, you get the real, you know, the real pricing elasticities, which are at essentially, you know, perfect. There's no information loss. If you use the proposed model, when kappa is high, which means a lot of privacy, we're getting upwards of 15% loss. When cap is low, which is lower privacy, right? We get about 5% loss. So what we've done is we've created a solution that you can get between five and five five and 15% loss on your pricing elasticities, but now have privacy, right? Now it's much harder to identify um, where the data came from. Whereas all the simple approaches are giving you a suboptimal frontier on the trade-off between data privacy on the x-axis and your ability to price your products on the y-axis. All right, so in conclusion, we developed a synthetic data model, and this is very similar to, let's say, generative adversarial networks, which is a recurrent neural network, AI, uh, to generate fake data 
right, to trade off privacy with how the data is used when sharing uh, retail data with business partners, right? Two, uh, we developed a business ecosystem for sharing data. And I would recommend you plot that before you start any kind of project or do any kind of data privacy. Three, uh, the conclusion is data utility improves when you consider how the data is used downstream, right? If you can infuse that into how it's protected, right? Now uh, it's more useful downstream. And also the added benefit for that is that the people that you're sharing the data with can't use it for a different reason. We've, we've determined to put the patterns in for how to price your items based upon quantity. You know, should you put it on sale? Should it be on feature? We haven't put in there, should you make the product a red color or a blue color? We haven't put that in there, right? So they can't do these random analyses that you didn't permit. And then lastly, I'll say marketers, or you can put policy analysts, uh, whatever um, domain you're in, need a seat at the privacy table. Too often it's decided by lawyers uh, or IT somewhat arbitrarily, right? So we really wanna have a passion for how the data is used downstream, right? And, and that's how we want to protect it, okay? All right, so that sums up this presentation. I do have a couple more slides that are more on the interactive end to show you how to uh, protect uh, some of the initial cases with the privacy risk. We had one question, so I, I guess we'll dig into some of the questions uh, now. If people know your model specification, could people reverse engineer the model trying different values for Kappa to recover store specific data. I guess it is more possible if they have some ground truth so they can improve the TAC model if that's the case. So yeah, the question is, can they, if, if on, on this chart here, we released all these sorts of uh, protected versions of the data set, right? Can they reverse engineer? And it, yeah, it's, it's somewhat possible actually, which is why when you release synthetic data, the main guideline is to only release one version of the synthetic data. Don't give them a hundred versions of the synthetic data, then they can recover your probability distribution, right? However, uh, in such data, this is less of a risk than um, data that's generated with AI because AI is fitting thousands and thousands of patterns, right? And there has been research when they were trying to uh, hide people's faces that they've been able to reverse engineer and recreate the original images of people's faces in the data set, right? But keep in mind, AI is fitting thousands and thousands of patterns. This one, you know, doesn't have that many patterns, right? It's, we've declared the model up front. So that is, that's a good question. Um, and feel free to list your questions because there's just a couple more minutes to slide and then I'll go fully into questions. So retail data. So if you remember the first linking case with John Smith. So typically what people do nowadays in practice, if you go out to these companies, is they'll just remove everything, right? They'll remove how much the people are spending, number of purchases, age, uh, maybe they'll remove all, you know, uh, zip codes, the real name, right? But you're not getting much information now. It's not useful information. It's overprotective. So now you can't even use the data. There was no reason that you collected the data in the first place. So that's one problem. So people do more advanced approaches, like they'll just release the average spend, right? And of course, uh, in this case, you can see here, there's two of the customers are identical. So it's harder to identify them, right? And then it should be clear to you that if you use the type of approach like the paper I just presented to you, to you this would be a random number that's generated based upon only those patterns that you want to exist. So maybe you wanted the age pattern with the zip code to hold true because people need it uh, to send some ads that aren't overly targeted, but just broadly targeted in order to stay profitable, right? But you certainly want to prevent this linkage here, right? So that's the goal here to prevent that linkage. From the other one that we said uh, for textual data, right? If you use a synthetic data model or even let's say even a um, generative AI model, what you can see here is these categories of data, uh, they would actually change, right? And this is identical to the work I've done uh, in pharma for clinical anonymizing clinical studies reports, which are thousands of pages, will actually change people's races, their ages, right? Um, but in the end of the day, when that clinical study report is released, you can't identify anybody there 
uh, with more than a 9% probability, but the doctors still have to read those reports. They still need to know that a certain subgroup, let's say race, age subgroup, gender subgroup, has a higher risk for a certain disease, right? So you must maintain those patterns. So this is actually really similar to that type of work. And then finally, um, for the uh, this huge data set that I showed you uh, before, what I've done in this paper was you can see an example here of an 88-year-old Vietnamese woman uh, in the original data. And you can see a level of education. They're very, she's very religious. Her income's very low. What we essentially do in that paper is we've turned her into a 42-year-old female that was born in the U.S., right, ethnicity Vietnamese. And you can see we've changed a bunch of variables. But when we change these variables, this isn't just random, right? We made it so that the correlation between all the variables were really similar and also the regression. So for this survey where they wanted to essentially uh, worry about the quality of services for Asian Americans uh, in the city of Austin, we made sure that their ability to do that, those patterns were still in there, right? So you can actually, my point is you can actually make somebody who's 88 years old, 42, right? But when you make their age lower, then you must change something like income must be higher. So you have to keep some of the correlation, but you can um, make synthetic people in that regard, right? Uh, taking it one step further, if you consider the purpose of why you're collecting the data in the first place, you might not need to collect all this data. So the biggest mistake that's made is collecting all this data, right? If you actually talk to the person using the data and saying, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to increase the quality of life for Vietnamese subpopulation in Austin, right? Or you say, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to get people to sign up for a cell phone plan. Well, this was from cell phone data. Turns out you only need to ask three questions that are impactful. One is select your age group. Two is select the number of members of your household. And three, do you own your residence? Those three are the most powerful for predicting whether somebody's gonna to subscribe to your cell phone plan. Everything else has a very minimal effect, right? So this is called a designing screening tool, which is really popular in public health. If you look at the work by Heejun Bang from UC Davis, you'll see that they actually use the full data set, make a model, reduce the model to the essential elements like you see here right, and, and categorize it. And then you can actually get that final model, right, which only has three elements, and then turn that into a survey that collects the minimal possible information to achieve your purpose, which in this case is if the prospect's total of points is above three, then target them for cell phone acquisition, right? So one, the thing I'm an advocate of is minimal data, data you know, collection, right? So, um, just to sum up, and I know it's, we have 12 minutes before 2.30. All the industry engagements that I do are related to these core data problems. I know some of them were simple examples, but the application of them is almost exactly the same. All right. Uh, most require a customized solution that considers the, the needs of data users. So in pharma, it's doctors, right? Um, Privacy protection is costly, especially for small organizations. So if you're a small organization, you really um, got the short end of the stick here because this is costly to hire somebody knowledgeable doing it. So in that case, what I would suggest is you do minimal data collection. It's going to be easier for you to, to look at, like why should big data exist, right? It's, we should see why it's going to be used first and then collect small data. More legislation to not increase privacy. Assume that the data will get out and collect the minimal possible data for your stated purpose. And then one of the, if you click the links here, I think this goes to one of my like uh, my consulting website, but this is a company that's interesting. They have video cameras set up. I did a privacy assessment for them and they use AI just behind the photo cell of the camera. Their only purpose is detecting facial emotion. They do not save any data on a server at all. They just detect emotion. And the only thing the camera releases is count. There's like seven females 
that were happy after trying this new drink. There's three females that were unhappy within a time window, right? So they're an example of a minimal data collection company that asked the stores, how do you want to use this data? We want to know whether people are happy testing this new product A, right? That's it. So if you click around that link or just Google Zenith AI, uh, you'll see some solutions and maybe you can apply that to your own um, practice. So here's, this is the final slide. And if there's any questions, we'll take them now. So um, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Schneider. It's really fascinating talk. Uh, so uh, we we do have. I, I see that we have uh, at least two questions that in the in the chat. Uh, do you want to uh, take a look and reply to yeah, questions? Okay. First question. At times, we might need the timestamp to help replenish help us replenish our stock. For example, at what time do we make coffee? Morning, afternoon, evening. This is privacy breach, but it might help the marketing manager in planning. Yeah, so I think what what the question is asking is, um, we really need that timestamp in order to do our business, right? Or else we're just we're not going to be able to do business effectively, right? So so that's that's required from you. But in this case, I I would maybe ask, do you need do you need the seconds? Do you need the minutes? Right? What is replenish our stock, are we talking about individual units being sold or, or you know, pallets of units, right? Is there an actual privacy issue here? It might not be this, you know, tied to a customer facing privacy issue, right? That's one thing. Or, um, so, so anyways, um, yeah, you might, you might need, you might need that um, if it was something that was privacy sensitive and you wanted to share it with another company. It is possible uh, to synthesize that time such that the same patterns where if you order on Wednesdays, that's the optimal time, uh, would still be shown through in the shared data. So in my experience, regardless of the application I've been working on, I get about a 10 to 15% loss in ability to, to do those sorts of things when the data is protected, right? And I, and I think that that's generally what I've gotten. I have one on time series forecasting now, ability to forecast, it's, it's a 14% loss. And forecast accuracy. So I believe you're forecasting stock replenishment. So I would expect that in exchange for privacy. Second question is, same for other demographic characteristics, we might need to determine what particular age or gender to target our promotion and product. So how do we go over this without compromising the privacy of the client? Okay, so it's a good question. Um, if you have somebody who's, let's say, female and 39 years old, right? Some of the methodology that I showed you here would change the 39. It, it could be to a random number around 39. Maybe it's from 32 to 48, right? So that would help mask the identity. Of course, when it, let's say we changed our age to 48, right? That's going to affect things a little bit, right? But there might be a chance that we're switching some other variable, let's say like gender from female to male, right? Such that that pattern or their purchasing likelihood, right? Or their ability to respond to a promotion is still similar in that other subgroup. So the switch might only be made, right? If both of the subgroups have the same response to that promotion. So that's being detected in these models, All right? Okay, another question. Do the algorithms underlying the models vary much for different purposes of synthetic data generation? So if there's commercial and medical. Yeah, so this is a really good question. And this is honestly the one pain point of this. The models are bespoke, like they're customized to the use case, the application, what I've showed you so far. So if you have a different purpose, like you want to send ads versus you want to replenish your stock, right? Your safety stock the synthetic data model might change, right? That's why a lot of researchers, and I'm reviewing some of these papers now, use generative AI models, right? Like, um, you know, obviously chat GPT is one, but you can see one like a, a generative adversarial network, okay? What this does is try to create, keep all those patterns at the same time, all right? 
And then it has an attacker within that model that's trying to uncover the identities and it ke keeps doing this push pull so it releases a data set, right? So there are options to where you can release synthetic data coming from that type of a model that has all of these use cases um, within it, right? But in my experience, I found that if you focus on the one use case, you usually get the best trade-off for that particular use case. All right, so so it's not the one size fits all approach is would be a more scalable data protection product uh, to use company wide, but it's also a lot more risky because then you're talking about uncovering patterns when you have thousands of um, layers fit in the neural network, right? That's a good question. And Matt, I'm thinking about the the uh, the edge cases. So in your data, the stores may have different probability of being exposed. Uh, so do, do you consider that as a risk? Maybe mm. some stores should be just removed from the data or you are agnostic and, and treat the stores have equally possibility of being exposed to a privacy risk? Yeah, so this is the question of deletion in the, in the data. Um, so in our application, we use, we looked at the maximum loss of protection for any store. So we wanted to provide mm. a guarantee for all stores. So typically that's how it's done if it's done the right way, mm. right? Usually how it's done uh, from a practical perspective is organizations will just start deleting stores of data or rows of data that are these edge cases or these outliers, right? The problem is the off the shelf software, if you go there now, like ones like AR, VIX or something like that. Um, I may have, that might be the other site I'm thinking of. There's a, there's a product out there where if you do that, literally most of your data will be deleted, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be a little bit careful because then you put preferences, like I want each row of data to look like eight other rows of data. And now all of a sudden, most of your data is dele deleted. Deleting has disastrous effects on, on your utility of, of how useful the data is. It's It's really bad. We have a new paper now, and, and you can go to, if you click my website here, we have a new paper that's been published in uh, Information Systems Research. We call it the K-Minimal Movement, KMM, Minimal Movement Model. So we don't delete data. We just move the data minimally, hmm. right? To make it look like uh, another, another row of, of data. So um, the easy way out is deletion. And we've compared in that paper deletion to that approach. And the usefulness of your data is within a couple percent using this K-minimal movement. If you delete your data, again, we're talking about these 50% losses. Mm -hmm. So deleting is an easy way out. And I assume that's the way that's currently being done in practice. So if anything, if you want to get involved in data privacy, the way to do it is never sell, never say, hey, I'm going to give you 90% of your usefulness for pri private, you know, for private data. Just say you can get more useful data when it's protected because you can because often when this data is shared people are getting this overly protected version right off the bat right 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 and yeah, then point, yeah right. does it make sense and then the last thing i'll say is um if you want to meet me uh i am a program chair for the uh, top forecasting conference in charlottesville virginia june 25th the abstracts are due march 7th sorry march 17th so if you have any work on um Forecasting, can, we have a lot of practitioners. We have people from the World Bank coming all over the place. Anything uh, predicting future values, send us an abstract by March 17th. Uh, we really support people that are starting out in their careers and um, even students as well. And it's in, it's in the U.S. every other year. So this is a good opportunity. We have uh, you know, a lot of people in public policy that come. We have somebody who's forecasting food availability and natural disasters, uh, ice, Arctic ice, all, all this type of stuff. So anyways, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, the, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Schneider. And also the, the, if uh, some of students uh, in my machine or deep learning classes here, we would encourage you to consider attending this conference. You know, since many of you have learned uh, basic about time series forecasting, I think it's a great place that you can uh, sharpen your skill and also um, making sure that the topics is related to not only forecast, but also something about social work or public health. Yeah, we, we have people presenting on uh, forecasting recidivism rates. 
right, in parole populations. We have a director coming from Department of Community Supervision in Georgia, uh, largest number of parolees uh, or supervisees per, per capita in the, the United States, I believe. So we, we have uh, uh, literally people from all over the world, all different uh, walks of life. We have forecasting for social good. Uh, you mm -hmm. can look that one up. There, there's a lot of efforts like forecasting water availability in uh, uh, countries without enough water. So it's actually you know, doing something to, to save lives, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, please, please come. It would be, uh, be great to have anybody that's passionate about the area. And there's a lot of, a lot of jobs available in this area too. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Great. Well, I, thank you so much, Dr. S Dr. Schneider and Dr. Ahn um, for the presentation today. Um, I'm going to close out. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that recording of this uh, event, as well as all of our other open classrooms are available on our YouTube. Um, I have a link in there. And then I would like to invite people to join us again. Um, we have a two-part series uh, open classroom series on AI using chat GPT in research that Dr. Ahn is going to present. The first part is April 13th, and then the second part is May 4th. And so you can register via the link in the chat. Um, and actually, as we close out, uh, Dr. Schneider, if you are able to drop the link to your symposium in the chat, um, just because I don't think our, our uh, uh, watchers can click on that. Yeah, they let me. Uh, uh, yeah, they can't click on the PDF. Let yeah. me put it right here. So, if, so um, you should be able to see that. Click that, and then there yeah. should be something that says abstract uh, submissions. I, I will personally see all of, you know, 400 abstract submissions or so. You can see the keynote speakers that are coming, and mm -hmm. odds are there's somebody in your area that's one of the keynote or practitioner speakers. Like really, there, there's we've got the whole. The whole span of forecasting worldwide from Google uh, to government. So we got everybody. So, That's all right. Great. It sounds like a great awesome. opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. And thank you to everyone in attendance today for engaging with us and learning with us. Have a great day. Thanks for your time. Bye. Thanks for the invitation. Thank nice you. you. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye.